welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. Well, hey, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to get down on my knees and I'm going to go ahead and go before the Lord in prayer. If you're able to stand, would you stand as we pray so that we could go before the Lord in honor and in reverence? Father, in the name of Jesus, Father, we give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. Lord, we're just grateful that we have the opportunity to come to church. Father, people around the world are dying just to read pages of the Bible, being persecuted for saying the name of Jesus. But here, we get to come and we get to freely worship you, Father. We get to celebrate being uh, in the body of Christ. And Lord, we don't come into this place to hear from a man. God, we don't come into this place to hear from a woman. God, we don't come to church for entertainment. Lord, we come into this place to hear from you. And we fully acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the senior leader of this church. And so it's in the name of Jesus that we ask, God, that your Holy Spirit would speak to us. To minister to us today, Father, I ask that you would open our eyes to see and our ears to hear your word, Father, as we dig into it today, Father, as we go over it, Lord, that it would be a seed sown onto good ground in our lives. We'd walk out of this building, Lord, and into our into the real world, Father, impacted and empowered and prepared to do what you have called us to do, Father, to be the work of the ministry. And Lord, we don't think of ourselves as better than anybody else, but as co-laborers. So Lord, the same blessing that we ask on ourselves, Father, I ask in the name of Jesus that you would set that upon every church. And you and apart all around the, around the world, Father, that is preaching and teaching the wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, we lift up our Catholic brothers and sisters, our Adventist brothers and sisters, our Lutheran, Presbyterian, Episcopalian, uh, Methodist brothers and sisters. Father, I thank you that you set your hand upon Harvest, on Oak Valley, on Ecclesia, Father, on Inland Christian Center, on San Bernardino Temple, Father, on, 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 on uh, Emmanuel Baptist, Father, on Crossroads, all the churches all across the Inland Empire, Father, our brothers and sisters, Lord, we thank you that we are many members of one body, all working together to serve in the ministry, to build your kingdom. And we give you the praise, Father, we give you the glory, and we give you the honor for all that you'll accomplish in your church. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said, Amen. Amen. Well, praise God, I'll tell you what, God is good. Well, hey, if you, uh, as you're being seated, why don't you go ahead and grab your Bibles, and, and let's go to the he- book of Hebrews, and the in the book of Hebrews, let's turn now. If you're just joining us, what we've been doing on Sunday mornings is we've been going through Hebrews. No, I'm just kidding. You're like, wait a minute, Pastor Luke, it's Sunday night. Ah, no, no, I'm just kidding. We're not going to continue in Hebrews, the fifth chapter. But we are going to go to Hebrews. Hebrews, the 13th chapter. You're like, Pastor Luke, I don't get what you're talking about. It's all right. Join us on a Sunday morning. We've been in Hebrews for quite a few uh, years. And here, I want you to go with me to Hebrews in the 13th chapter. Hebrews in the 13th chapter. I want to take you to the, to the, to the benediction, to the, to the closing thoughts, the closing statements of, of this, this book. And I want to look at some of the thoughts that the author of Hebrews, the Bible doesn't tell us who wrote Hebrews. History has its assumptions, and there are some people that think one person wrote it or another person. But the fact of the matter is, it, do, it doesn't matter. But it was the, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And here, here the author of Hebrews is closing with their benediction, their, their, their prayer request or their, their closing statement. And, and I want to show you some things, but before we get into that, I want to talk to you about tonight's title. Tonight's title I thought would be a fun night, be kind of an interesting uh, a thought is, is as you're turning to the book of Hebrews. The title of tonight's message is called Batteries Included. Hey, it's the Christmas season. Y'all probably were out there trampling each other at Walmart at 8 o'clock on Thursday night trying to get those Black Friday deals. Uh, is there any parents in the house today? Is there anybody who's got kids? Any grandparents maybe? Hey, is there anybody that's, that, that was a child of a parent? Oh, come on, it's everybody, right? You probably know. You've been there before. I'm sure everybody's been there at some point or another. You know, you get that Christmas present or that birthday present, and it's in the fancy plastic wrapping or in the big cardboard box, and you're all excited about it. And you remember looking at the kids as they're in their pajamas or whatever, and they're tearing into the present. And they're, like, super excited, and they open it up, and they push the little on button, and nothing happens. You look on the little box, and it's in that, like, size negative .025 font, you know, upside down and backwards on the underside of the box. It says, batteries not included. You know what I'm talking about? So you go scrounging. Hey, I don't know. Maybe I'm the only one. Maybe you go scrounging through that, you know, you got that junk drawer, that one drawer that kind of collects everything. You don't know what to call it. So you go scrounging through that one drawer in the house, and you open it, and everything explodes out of it because it's just the junk, the, the drawer that compl- You're trying to find batteries, and you're putting batteries here together, and you piece them together. What a frustrating thing. Well, tonight I want to talk about batteries included. Hey, looking at our relationship with God. 
Now, you, you've probably heard the, the term or, or heard the phrase in, in, in some form of compassion or, or, or some form of fashion. But, you know, when God calls us to do something, he equips us to do something. And in our lives, batteries are included. In the package of our life, when it comes to God assigning us or God giving us a purpose, each and every one of us in this place, we're born with a purpose from God. Let me tell you something. The package of your life on the corner in big, bold font, it says about you, batteries included. You don't have to live the life of frustration going through life trying to figure out how am I going to get this done how am I going to do this? And so today we're going to talk about the idea of God equipping, of God enabling, empowering us to do what he has called us to do, to live the life that he has called us to do. We don't have to go about this alone. So here we find ourselves in Hebrews in the 13th chapter. Hebrews in the 13th chapter. The, 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 the closing thoughts in verse number 20. It says, now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Listen to what he says now about you and I. Make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now here he says now to God... And he talks about blessings of Jesus Christ, the great shepherd, the God and the father of Jesus Christ. He says, make you complete. See here, what the author of Hebrews is saying is that God has included batteries in your calling. God has included everything he needs to complete some good works. You there? To complete some good works? It's on the overhead, guys. No. To complete partial good works. Every good work. You see, God, for everything God has for you, God has given you or will give you what you need to do the job. God has never asked you. God has never called you, said, oh, I want you to be, you know, Jesus says, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send laborers across the path of those who need to hear. God doesn't call you and I to be harvesters without giving us the tools needed to do the harvest. And so when we go about our daily lives, when Monday comes, when Tuesday comes, thir Wednesday comes, Thursday comes, Friday comes, we're at the workplace, we're at the schools, we're with the families or the friends or out, in, out and about wherever it might be, understand that whatever God has got for us, God has given us the ability and given us the means to do what he has asked us to do. So you see, we don't have to live a life like the frustrating toy industry where you have batteries. And hey, I don't know if you've ever been there with a toy where you didn't have those those odd size, like size D batteries, and all of a sudden the kids want to play with the toy, and you don't have the batteries. So then they go on to the next toy that, 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 this, that you do have the batteries for, and they start playing with that toy, and this toy that doesn't have the batteries. They, this is me. I'm just telling you my house. My boy, my little boy's got all these toys with batteries. And the ones that don't have batteries, they don't make any noise. And when they don't make any noise, they get shoved to the bottom of his toy bin. And then we forget about that toy, and it stays in the bottom of his toy bin, and we never go out and buy the batteries for that toy, and it never gets turned on. You see, that's not us, though. God has given us everything we need to complete what he has. We're not the toy that gets jammed into the bottom of the toy bin because we were forgotten about. No, 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 no. Batteries included. Hey, rechargeable batteries included. Hey, all right, lithium ion technology batteries are included. Hey, we got everything we need through the grace and the power of God. So tonight, what I want to do, I want to take you through some of the, some of the stories of the Old Testament. We're going to go play around in the Old Testament. We're going to look at some stuff in the New Testament. And I want to show you some people, some thoughts about being equipped by God. Some people that in the Word of God, God sent them, God put something on their heart, God pushed them or moved them in a direction that he wanted them to go. And I want to show you just little segments of each one of these, of these individuals' lives and show you about the equipping of God and then take the thought behind that and, and kind of chew on it a little bit. Let's look a little bit deeper into it. So can we, can we kind of play around? Can we go look around and bounce around the Old Testament and look at some examples of being equipped by God tonight? Are you with me tonight? Can we do that? All right, let's talk about tonight. We're talking about being equipped by God. You see, God gives us everything we need to do what God has called us to do. And it doesn't matter 
whether that's to be a businessman or to be, to be a, a great evangelist, to be a pastor, to be a teacher, to be an apostle. It doesn't, hey, it doesn't matter what the, what the calling of God is. Each and every one of us on the very base level, God has called us to be harvesters. If anything else, to share the love of Jesus Christ with a lost and dying world through our life, through our, through our actions, through our words, through our responsibilities. So God has equipped each and every one of you today with a particular calling. But all together as a whole, the church body, we all share the same calling. And that's the great commission to go and to teach and preach Jesus Christ, the gospel, and make disciples of every nation. So we can take, it doesn't matter, you say, Pastor Luke, I don't know what my calling is. Well, that's fine. You just heard part of it, okay? That's the very basis, the foundation of what it is. So let's apply that to life today. So we're talking about being equipped by God. And let's take a look at some people. Number one. We're talking about being equipped by God, and I'm going to give you some thoughts, and then I'm going to take you to who I'm talking about. So number one, we're talking about being equipped by God. I want to give you some thoughts. Number one is uh, being equipped by God reflects God, not you. And you say, okay, what does that mean, Pastor? Look, let me explain that to you a little bit like this. When you are equipped by God, when God gives you something to do, hey, listen, it doesn't always look how you think it's going to look. God tells you, you feel like, oh, God tells you, hey, Go minister to your neighbor or go witness to your neighbor or talk to your coworker. God tells you, hey, go, go on a missions trip. Or God tells you, hey, do this or puts it upon your heart to do something. You say, okay, God, if that's the case, if you need me to do this and this, then in order for me to do that, I'm going to need this and I'm going to need this and it's going to have to line up like this and I'm going to have to have this day off and, I'm gonna, and, 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 and you have this whole great and mighty scheme of how things are going to work. I don't know about anybody else, but I, I, I have a hard time in life. Some people can just go through life and just kind of float around. And, and just, it just, you know, they're kind of like the women of the moment. They're, all right, I'm just going to roll with it. I got no plans in life. Me, man, it drives me nuts. My wife and I go on vacation. It's like the most stressful time for me. And we fight even more when we're on vacation because it's like, okay, we got to get to the hotel by this point. And I got to, and do I know this road? Does the I-95 connect to the I-5? And then this and that. And, and we got to have plans. And so I look at it and say, no, it's got to be like this. Boom, 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 boom. And it's the same thing with our thoughts with God. It's that, hey, God. You want me to do this? Okay, that's fine. It's got to be like this. Du, 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 and we lay it out. But God says, hey, listen, it doesn't reflect your ability. It's not about you. It's not about your capability. It's not about how strong you are. It's not about how good looking you are. It's not about how rich you are. It's not about how well you speak or how well you don't speak. It's not about you. See, the, the equipping of God reflects God, not you. And it's abilities of God in your life that make the difference. Now let me show it to you in the word of God. I love this story. Great and mighty story. Let's go, go with me to the book of Judges. Judges in the Old Testament. The book of Judges. We're going to go to the book of Judges in the seventh chapter. Judges in the seventh chapter. And we're going to look at a young man by the name of Gideon. Now, Gideon is this young man, and, 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 and the Lord comes to him. Let me give you a little bit of background. As the Lord comes to Gideon, and he tells him, an angel of the Lord comes to Gideon and tells Gideon that he's going to be the one that leads an army against the people that oppose God. And here Gideon is actually, at the time that the angel comes to him, Gideon, Gideon is hiding in a wine press, in, 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 in uh, you can imagine just like a, a large barrel or something like that. Uh, uh, and he's hiding from the people that are opposing the children of Israel. And, he, and he's threshing his wheat, or he's, 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 he's bringing in his harvest, but he's doing it in a place that it wouldn't normally be, be done because he didn't want somebody to see him and take all of, his, all of his goods. And so the angel of the Lord comes to Gideon and tells Gideon that he's going to be the leader of the army. And so Gideon kind of goes back and forth a little bit about this. And now we find ourselves in the seventh chapter of, of the book of Judges, and now Gideon has an army. Gideon has assembled a, a grouping of men, and now the, the armies of those who oppose God are encamped off in the distance, and they can see it. And now Gideon has this great and mighty army, and we pick up in verse number one of the seventh chapter. In verse number one of the seventh chapter, it says, Then Jerubbabel, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him rose early and encamped beside the well of Herod, so that the camp of the Midianites was on the north side of them by the hill of Moreh in the valley. Now look what verse number two says about Gideon and his army. Now, 
Let's do a little bit of math as we start talking about this. The Lord said to Gideon, the people who are with you are too many. And whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I mean, you're talking about armies. We're talking about military force. There's never a military concept where you can think about that says there are too many people. Your army is too big for this fight. That's a good thing. When you roll up to a fight and you've got a lot of people, generally that's a favorable thing. The more, the merrier, right, in the army. So, but God says to Gideon, no, 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 no. Listen, he says, the people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. Lest Israel, check this out, lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, my own hand has saved me. Now, you remember, we're talking about being equipped by God. First point today was, is that it reflects God, not us. And here God's saying, hey, listen, with the, the amount of people that you have, Gideon, there are too many. They can, you can say, hey, no, 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 that's just the fact that you had a lot of people. It wasn't God that delivered you. It was your numbers that delivered you. So he says, Gideon, I'm going to give you the opportunity to reduce your numbers. So look what God says to Gideon. Verse number three. Now, therefore, proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, whoever is fearful and afraid, let him turn and depart at once from Mount Gilead. And listen to this. And 22,000 of the people returned, and 10,000 remained. Okay, now I told you, let's do a little bit of math. So Gideon starts out with 32,000 people. Wow, that's the population of Loma Linda. All right, so Gideon's got all of Loma Linda, maybe two-thirds of Ukaipa, all right, somewhere in there. And God says, no, Gideon, that, that number's too much. It, 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 you guys can say that you did it on your own, so let's reduce this. You just tell anybody, hey, listen, if you're afraid, if you're, if even though you're a warrior, if you're just going into this thing and you're just not, mm, not quite sure, it's okay. I'll release you of your duties. Go home. And so 22,000, I mean, can you imagine what Gideon's thinking right now as he sees this exodus of 22,000 people? Has anybody ever been to an amusement park where they've seen a line, maybe for a ride, a long ride? We were just at Disneyland this last weekend, and we were there as the park was opening. And there was probably 5,000 people, right, somewhere in there, at the opening, and they, they, they dropped the rope, and the people, it was a mad dash. 5,000 people, it was like you couldn't, you couldn't if, if you were in the middle of the crowd, you just moved with it. You couldn't go anywhere else. You were just swimming. You, you were going with the current. That's 5,000 people. Now, look and imagine Gideon here is, is addressing the people, and he says, hey, okay, if you're afraid, you could go home. And all of a sudden, two-thirds leaves. Gideon's like, God, what are you doing? Okay, all right. Okay, God, I get it. It's not about me. It's about you. I can do it with 10,000. Move on. So 10,000 remain. Verse number four. <laughs> Verse number four comes along, and but the Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. Bring them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. It will be that those who I say to you, this one shall go with you, the same shall go with you. And whom I ever I say to you, this one shall not go with you, the same shall not go. Verse number five, so he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, everyone who laps from the water with his tongue as a dog laps, set apart by himself. Likewise, everyone who gets down on his knees to drink. And the number of those who lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, was 300. And all the rest of the people got down on their knees to drink water. Okay, so we had 10,000, so that means 9,700 people. I'll give you the illustration. If the stage here is the, is the riverbed, 9,700 people got down on their knees and stuck their face in the water and drank like that. Okay? 300 got down on their knees and they grabbed it with their hand and they brought the water up. Okay? So Gideon's probably looking at this, these two groups of people saying, okay, God, 9,700 people, praise God, I'll do it. We got it. Nine, those 300 people, they were, they were inefficient drinkers. The water was spilling out of their hands. That must mean they're inefficient fighters. They don't know what they're doing. Those who stuck their face in the water, hey, they got all the water they needed. But look what God says to Gideon about these two people. Then the Lord said to Gideon, by the 300 men who lap, I will save you. And deliver the Midianites into your hand. Let all the people go, every man to his place. Now, can you imagine the thoughts of Gideon here right now? We're talking about being equipped by God. God gave Gideon an army. God gave Gideon an army of 32,000 soldiers. Hey, that's a good army. 
God says, okay, it's too big. I want some glory out of this. Let's send some home. All right, so now he's got 10,000. Okay, that's a good army still. Can you imagine Gideon's heart, Gideon's thoughts, when all of a sudden Gideon now sees the 9,700 leaving, walking away with 300 people? That's less than what's in here tonight. Do you realize that starting out with an army of 32,000 people, we'll subtract 22,000 from that, and then go back and subtract 9,700, Gideon was left with less than 1% of his starting army. But the fact of the matter is, is that when God equips you, it doesn't reflect you, it reflects God. And it was those 300 that went to the camp. It was those 300 that went and they chased them off. They surrounded them at the night and they blew their horns and they ran. And the Bible says that they drew their swords. The people, the enemies, the Midianites, they drew their swords and they started fighting each other because there was confusion. And they ran and the 300 pursued them. Now you've seen the movie 300, whatever, that's Greek mythology. Hey, there's Gideon 300, that's the truth. Because when God equips you, you see, when God equips you, it's not going to look or not always going to look like you think it's going to look. God says, hey, minister to your neighbor. Okay, God, well, it's got to be on a sunny day. They've got to be out mowing their lawn, and they've got to be just sitting there looking into the sky, maybe pondering if there's a God or not, and then I will show up with a cloud of glory upon me. And I, you see, no, no, no. God says it'll look how, it, how I want it to look, not how you want it to look. But be a good cheer because God's on our side. Batteries are included. So we're talking about being empowered by God. Number two today. Are you guys with me? Are we okay? Number two today, being equipped by God always comes at the right time. It always comes at the right time. Now, you and I, we live in a I want it, I got to have it right now society. We have phones nowadays that you don't, you, know, you don't even have to put a CD in a computer. You can go online or you can, with your phone, push a button and download a song instead of having to go to the record store and buy it. You can go and, and you can talk to somebody and call them right off the bat. Remember back in the day when you actually had to like wait till somebody got home around 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, and then you had to interrupt their dinner hour by picking up a phone? Some of you remember when you had to pick up a phone and turn your finger like this. Some of you remember when you had to pick up a can with a rope tied to it. I'm just kidding. The fact of the matter is, is that in our society, in our generation, in our day and age, it's an instant generation. You know, the other day I was, I was making, I was, I was trying to make some oatmeal. My wife and my boy had gone out and it was just, just me. And you know, when men, when men are left to eat on their own, we eat the cardboard boxes because we just don't know what else to do. And my wife had the, that instant oatmeal, those little packages where you just put them in the, put them in the bowl and you microwave the water. And I was re this is, this is a true story. Pastor Jim always does this, true story. I was microwaving, I put, the, I put the oatmeal in there and I read the package and it said microwave the water for 90 seconds. And I thought to myself, that's a long time to wait. I'm going to go eat a bowl of cereal. And I put the oatmeal aside because I didn't want to wait 90 seconds, one and a half minutes for water to get hot to eat my breakfast. So I decided I'm going to eat a cold, stale breakfast instead. That is the generation we live in. We have microwave dinners. We have fast food. If you don't get it within two minutes or less, it's free. Whatever you do, you can call ahead now to the fast food place and have it already ordered. So all you got to do is show up and they give it to you. You could use your phone to do that. It's amazing. But we live in an instant generation. We live in an instant society where we want it right now, right now, right now, right now. Pastor Dan talked about this a little bit this morning. We go before God and we say, God, okay, I need your equipping. God, I understand you have called me. God, give it to me. I need it. Did I get a text message from God? Huh? God. And when it doesn't come on our timing, we think God missed it. The fact of the matter is, is that the equipping from God always comes at just the right time. But it may not be what you think the timing is, but rather when God thinks the timing is right. I was driving past this lumber yard. I saw this interesting quote. And it said, experience always comes just after you needed it. <laughs> because you experienced it. Right? You get it? You're like, oh, I don't get it. You needed the experience. You went through it. You just got the experience. The timing of God comes just in the right time. Let's look at that, what the, what the Word of God says. Go with me to the book of Genesis. Let's go to the book of Genesis. We're going to look at uh, Abraham now. Genesis in the 22nd chapter. We're going to look at Abraham. 
What an amazing story. What, what a, a, a heart-wrenching story if you read this, if, if you've ever had uh, children or if you, you're close to children. And when God asks Abraham to test his faith, to give his only son Isaac, his only son from his beloved wife Sarah, Isaac, his promised son, God comes to Abraham and God says to Abraham, he sends a messenger, uh, an angel of the Lord, of the Lord goes to Abraham and says, Give me your son Isaac. Offer him up as a burnt offering to a place I'll show you. So Abraham, the Bible tells us, Abraham rises early in the morning. Doesn't, doesn't procrastinate. Doesn't say, all right, next year I'll do this. Okay, I'm going to do this later on. The Bible tells us that the next day, Abraham got up with his son and with this group. And they went to the place where God had showed him. And Abraham takes Isaac up there. And, 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 and the interesting thing is, is Isaac, Isaac's old enough to kind of see what's going on. And he's walking up the mountain with his dad. He says, Dad. Abraham says, yes, what's going on? Here I am. He says, we've got the fire. We've got the altar. Where's the sacrifice? And Abraham's response to Isaac is, well, God himself will provide a lamb for the sacrifice. So God is testing Abraham. So all of a sudden, the Bible begins to tell us that Abraham takes his son Isaac and, and he binds him and he places him up on the altar. I mean, you can just imagine the tears are probably running down Abraham's face and the, the sight of what he thinks he's about to do. And look what happens. Genesis in the 22nd chapter. Verse number 10. Verse number 10 in Genesis, the 22nd chapter, it says, And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. So here's Abraham's got the knife in his hand to end Isaac's life, to offer him as a sacrifice, because that's what the angel of the Lord told him to do, to test his faith with God. So here Abraham has got his hand up in the air. Remember, we're talking about the equipping of God always comes at the right timing. Here, Abraham has got his hand up in the air, ready to go. But then the angel of the Lord, verse number 11, called to Abraham and said, Abraham, Abraham, exclamation point, calling him out. So he said, here I am. You know, Abraham's like, oh, thank God. Oh, thank you, I'm not alone. <laughs> at least it's a couple extra minutes. And he says, here I am. And the angel says, do not lay your hand on the lad, nor do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your only son from me. Listen to what verse number 13 says. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked and there behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. And verse number 14 says, And Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide, as it is said in this day, the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. See, interesting is that Abraham told his son, God will provide a lamb for the sacrifice. Prophetically speaking about Jesus Christ in the future, but also speaking about Abraham's instant right that moment. And here Abraham has his hands up at just the right time. The angel of the Lord calls out to Abraham and says, don't, you've passed the test. Now, here's the interesting thing. It says that Abraham lifted his eyes and saw a ram caught in the thicket. Now, I don't know if anybody's ever been around livestock before. Pastor Debbie, a couple weeks ago, talked about the example of when Stacy and myself and Pastor Deborah were, were uh, driving in the mountains and we, we saw a sheep stuck in an irrigation dick, ditch. We got a, a wonderful opportunity to be up close and personal with that sheep. They smell. <laughs> if you've ever been around livestock, if you've ever been around... Uh, cow, oh, Lord, if you've ever been around goats, they stink, okay? Number one, let's think about this. Abraham lifted up his eyes, and there's a ram caught in the thicket. He didn't smell the stench of a goat. My mother-in-law had a goat. It smelled. So number one, goats smell. Secondly, goats, rams, especially of that side, not the sheep, but the goats and the rams, they're loud. We lived in Ukaipa. Our neighbor had a goat all day long. You remember Sally? Or no, it was your mom's, your goat. Your, the neighbors had a goat. All day long. <laughs> all day long. Goats aren't quiet. Yet Abraham didn't notice the goat. But all of a sudden, Abraham lifted his eyes. There's a ram caught in the thicket. Secondly, if you've ever seen an animal in the wild stuck, I like to do this with my dogs at home. I play with my dogs, and I pin them down. We wrestle around, and I kind of get my dog in a body lock. Oh, man, it's just crazy to see what an animal will do when it's stuck, how bad they thresh to get out of it. Now, I'm not torturing my dog. Don't write me letters. They'll claim it. <laughs> but a goat with his, a ram with his horns stuck in a bush isn't just going to sit there 
hmm, I'm stuck. I'm going to hang out here. That lamb that Pastor Deborah, Stacy, and I went to go and pull out of the irrigation ditch, even though it was exhausted, when we came near it, it didn't just say, oh, thank God you're here. It started kicking, it started thrashing, it started moving its head around because it was afraid of us. It was afraid of being caught. You see, so there's a ram stuck in the thicket. It's making all sorts of new noise. It's got to be moving the bush. But Abraham doesn't notice it because God provides the equipment, the equipping, the sacrifice, the lamb that Abraham told his son, God will give us one. God provides at just the right time. Just when you think it might be too late, just when you think, God, are you missing out on this? God, you called me, but I don't have it. God provides at the right time. Look at Abraham, could have thought this is hopeless with his hand up in the air. But God came in and intervened on his behalf and provided at just the right time. Number three tonight, we're talking about being equipped by God. Being equipped by God. Are you still with me? Are we all right? Okay. Being equipped by God. Number three tonight, being equipped by God builds faith and dependence. I guess you could say builds faith and dependence on God. You know, the, the fun thing about being equipped by God is that once you have been equipped by God, you know about it. Has anybody ever gone and done something that God has called them to do or God has asked them to do and they knew that God came through and gave them the ability to do that. Has anybody ever been there? It's a fun feeling. What happens is you begin to realize, like point number one, that it's not about you, that it's about God. And the more you begin to be equipped by God, the more your faith is, is, is enabled and built. Hey, guess what? I went there and God came and he bailed me out. Hey, guess what? I had to do this and God was there and he gave me what I needed to do. Hey, guess what? I was down and low and out and God gave me the ability to pull myself up through the grace of Jesus Christ. Hey, guess what? And all of a sudden your faith is built. Your faith is strengthened because you see the faithfulness of God. Your reliance is built because you realize, hey, I didn't have the ability to do that. My situation was hopeless. I didn't, I'm, I'm an introvert. I can't talk to somebody, whatever it might be. You realize, hey, guess what? It was God that did it. Therefore, my reliance on God grows as well. And I realize that it's not about me. It's not about my ability. It's not about my talents. But it's about God. And the more that God equips us, the more it builds our faith and it builds our reliance on God. Let's look at this, this uh, classic story and let's go to the book of 1 Samuel. We were in 1 Samuel this morning. But let's look at 1 Samuel in the 17th chapter. We're going to go to the story of David and Goliath. The story of David and Goliath. And let me tell you, that, let me just share this while you turn to this first Samuel in the 17th chapter. You know, in our young adult service, we just concluded a series on faith, a really in-depth series. It's online if you want to hear it. It's not just for young adults. Every Christian needs to hear it. But we just concluded a, re concluded a real in-depth series on, on, about faith, the basics of faith. And one of the things that we talked about is when we, when we have faith, we've got to strengthen our faith. We've got to grow our faith. We've got to feed our faith. And the question is, what do we feed our faith on? And the answer to that question is we feed our faith on the very things that formed our faith, that built our faith, and we feed our faith on the past experiences of God coming through in our life. Just talking about the same exact idea here, that God has, has come through. He's equipped us already once before. We build on the fact that God is reliable. And here, let me show you a story about a young man who feeds his faith based on the past experiences of God giving him the ability to do something at the right time. In 1 Samuel, the 17th chapter, here's the story of David and Goliath. You know the story of the big giant from the Philistines saying, you send one representative and him and I will fight together just one on one. And the winner of that battle will be the master. Our army will be the master over the others. The, the loser's army will be the slaves to the victor. And all of Israel sits there and they're cowering because Goliath is a big dude. Big guy. Goliath is a, is a professional warrior trained from the beginning to be a fighter and everybody's afraid of Goliath everybody's hiding back and here's this little boy David his father sent him to bring his brother some food on the battle line and David hears the taunts of Goliath and you guys probably know this story and David hears what Goliath is saying and how Goliath is cursing God and cursing the Israel Israelites and David says to everybody is there not a cause is there not a reason for somebody to stand up who does this guy think he is that he can defile the armies of the living God. And so David has this faith, this statement that rises up and he begins to speak out and everybody tells him, ah, be quiet, ah, be quiet. But word reaches King Saul. 
And so they bring David to King Saul talking about Goliath. And Saul begins to talk to David. And David says, hey, listen. Don't worry about it. Don't let this guy ruin your heart. I'll fight him. Remember, David, the Bible says that David was ruddy, okay, kind of good looking, kind of skinny. It just, I always imagine like the redheaded stepchild, right? Because Jesse didn't even consider David when Samuel came to anoint everybody. He left David on the field, all right? So David was kind of this, you know, kind of, he was a musician, all right? And for all you musicians, I play guitar too, so I can joke with you. But David was kind of, the, the, he was a different one. And so now all of a sudden, here's this, here's this guy who likes to play the harp, and he's talking to, to King Saul. And, and he listen to what he says to King Saul. Listen to what David says to King Saul. In verse number 32, David says to Saul, let no one's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. And Saul says to David, you can't go because of your youth. You're too small. He was a warrior from the days of his youth. And David says to Saul in verse number 34, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came out and took the lamb out of the flock, I went out, listen to what David said, I went out after it. I went out after it. Now, I remember one time I went camping in Yosemite, and a bear sniffed our tent and climbed on our, on our, on our car. It touched my wife's head with its nose, and she lost it. And then it was over. All right, camping trip, done. Because there's a bear in the camp. Everybody's like, and I always tell everybody, look, man, you got a better chance of being struck by lightning than being mauled by a bear, especially. You know, I go through all the statistics. The fact of the matter is, it's kind of human nature. When you see a bear, run. When, okay, all right, a bear, you know, cuddly, brown bear. Okay, all right, what, about, what about a lion? What about a lion? A big 300, 400, 500 pound cat. You see what lions do to mice? They play with them. You look at them and you think, oh, they're going to do that to me if I don't get out of here. It's human nature to run. But here David says, I went out after. I chased that bear down. I hunted that stinking bear down. And I went and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it rose against me, now let's go back to this again. You see those pictures with the big bear? You see the movies? Remember Bart the bear from the 90s, that big old bear? He raised up and he growled. He's like 10 feet tall. David says, when the bear got up on its hind quarters and growled at me, again, sign to run. You can have the sheep. Enjoy it. Didn't want it anyways. David says, when it rose against me, I caught it by the beard. I grabbed that bear by its mouth. And I struck it and killed it. Interesting. Verse number 36, your servant killed both a lion and a bear. And this, listen to what David says. Now the faith of God, the equipping of God steps in. And he says, your servant has killed both a lion and a bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. Seeing he has defiled the armies of the living God. Now listen to the faith of David. Listen to the equipping of David, how we're talking about the equipping of God. Build your faith and your reliance on God. Listen to what David says to Saul. Moreover, David says, so on top of everything David's already said, he says, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. So David's faith was so strong, his reliance on God was so strong that, listen to this, a, a small, ruddy, teenage kid convinced the king of an entire nation to let him be the sole representative in a battle of a one-on-one -on -one against a professional warrior who was anywhere between 8 and 10 feet tall. He, he, he convinced Saul to say, okay, you're our man, go for it. And you know the story, David goes and he collects some rocks, puts them in his pouch. Goliath comes running after David, and David grabs a rock out of his pouch, and he slings it. And the Bible tells us that Saul ran out, or Goliath ran after David with armor and a sword, and David ran after Goliath with a sling and a rock. And David defeated Goliath with a sling and a rock. You see, it wasn't about God. It wasn't about, or I'm sorry, it wasn't about David. It wasn't about David's strength. It wasn't about David's armor. It wasn't about anything. It was about God intervening. And so when we're talking about the equipping of God, the more that God equipped us, the more that God steps in on our life. Let me tell you something, church. It's a wonderful thing because it builds your faith and it builds the fact that you are reliant on God in your life. Are you with me tonight? We're talking about one more. Let's conclude with one last thought for tonight. We're talking about being equipped by God. The batteries are included in our life. 
Last but not least for tonight, number four, being equipped by God, number four, starts with opening your mouth. Being equipped by God starts with opening your mouth. Turn with me to the book of Matthew in the 10th chapter. Matthew in the 10th chapter. The Bible tells us that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Sometimes, church, in our life, we need to speak, not necessarily so that somebody else hears. Sometimes we need to speak it out loud so that we hear it. Sometimes we need to be vocal about what God has called us to do. Like David, as he went to the armies and he went to the feed his brothers, the, the, the sustenance for, for, for their battle, David hears Goliath and David doesn't stay quiet. David starts running his mouth. He doesn't stop. And everybody tells him, stop talking. And he tells them, isn't there a cause? Doesn't this upset anybody else? And David begins to be vocal about his faith about the fact that somebody needs to step up, and if nobody else will step up, then I'll do it. But he begins to start speaking, he opens his mouth. And sometimes, church, you and I need to be vocal. You know what? Hey, how about being vocal with your neighbor? Not being vocal with your neighbor the way you sometimes want to be vocal with your neighbor. No, no, I'm not talking about that kind of vocal. But I'm talking about how about saying the words God, the words Jesus, the words bless you, the words love you in a conversation to them. Start small, but open your mouth. How about, I was talking to our staff a couple of weeks ago on Thanksgiving, before Thanksgiving, and I said, hey, why don't you just pray like Harry and Cheryl Salem were talking about a few Sundays. Pray for the opportunity to just speak or share the love of God, of Jesus Christ, uh, to, to somebody at the Thanksgiving table. Well, just so happens that I got to sit with a, a, a members of Stacy's side of the family that we don't ever see, seen it maybe two or three times in my life, and we just started talking. And we started talking about a locale, and in that locale came up the subject of a church in that locale. And talking about church led to talking about God. And I got to start using those words, oh, praise God, bless God, Jesus loves you. And I start to, we start to talk about the love of Jesus Christ, and we converse. And I don't know where they're at in their relationship with God, but God gave me the opportunity to start sharing the love of God. And I started telling God has blessed me. God, I tell you what, God is so faithful to me and my family. And I just started to share how the love of God is in my life. And it became evident. And by the time I was done with that conversation, I looked over. And there wasn't just one or two people across the table where I was at. Because there was only two of us at the table. But now all of a sudden, her whole family was seated around the table. And we were talking. And I thought, God, here's my opportunity. If anything, all I got to do was just tell them that God loves them. And that God is the God of love. But I started by me opening my mouth. You see, if I wouldn't have opened my mouth, I wouldn't have said anything. If I wouldn't have said anything, they wouldn't have heard anything, and I would not have had my opportunity. But God equipped me. God gave me the opportunity. But God didn't just give the opportunity. Hey, God gives you the words, too. Let me show it to you, the word of God. In the book of Matthew, in the 10th chapter, Jesus Christ is sending his disciples out. Interestingly, interestingly enough, Jesus says to his disciples, don't take money. Don't take anything with you. But go and, 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 and you know, find the people that will take you in. And so he kind of sends them out on a faith mission. But here in, this, in the 19th verse, I'm sorry, let's start. In the 16th verse of the 10th chapter, Jesus says to his disciples, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues. You will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. Now, right there off the bat, you think the disciples would be like, Psh. Uh, Jesus, as a matter of fact, I had somewhere I got to be. Can I meet up with you right after this assignment's over? Can I take a rain check on this one? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over here. Now, I, I, the whole scourging thing kind of, eh, not there. But look what Jesus says to them. Verse number 19, but when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak, for it will be given, listen to this, for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. Going back to point number one, it's not about us, it's about God. It reflects God, not us. Look what Jesus says. Verse number 20, for it is not you who speaks, but the spirit of your father who speaks into you. You see, the equipping of God comes, but you have got to open your mouth and trust that God will fill it. You have got to start by doing something. Open it. 
Speak it and allow God to use you. I remember I was having a conversation with a friend of mine. And he was laying out all these things and he was talking about all these different things in his life and kind of, you know, going here and going there. And, and I was just kind of seeing some things. And some of the, in my heart and my mind, I'm thinking, okay, how do I respond to this? What do I say? I don't, I don't know what to say to this. And I just started, as he was talking, we were talking for a good couple hours. And he probably spent the first hour just talk, kind of talking to me. And, and I just started, as he was talking, I was just praying. I was listening to him, but I was praying in my head and praying in my heart. Lord, I ask that your Holy Spirit speak to me. Give me the words to say to him. Because it's not about anything I can say. I don't know anything. But it's about what God says. And all of a sudden, I begin to open my mouth and I begin to talk. And scripture after scripture after scripture after scripture about started coming up. And it was just like I was, I was just spitting them out. And I'm, I'm, I, I have like a third person experience. Have you ever had one of those where you kind of like, you stepped out of yourself and that your, your, yourself was kind of over here running? And I was kind of looking over at the side like, dang. <laughs> I didn't even know I knew that stuff. And it was just coming out, and it was just coming out, and he was just sitting there, like, absorbing it, like, oh, oh, oh. And at the end of the conversation, he goes, you know, man, I just feel better having talked to you. Yeah. Hey, guess what? You didn't talk to me. Yeah. You talked to the Spirit of God. Yeah, because even though it was me using it, all I did was open my mouth, and I, didn't, I knew off the, right off the bat, I had nothing to say. But I opened my mouth, and like Jesus told his disciples, it won't be me. It will be the Spirit of God inside of you that speaks out, that will equip you, that gives you the words to say. So rest assured, when you're at the job, when you're at home, when you're at the neighbors, when you're, in the, when you're with somebody, God will give you the words to say. All you got to do is open your mouth and allow him to use you. We're talking about being equipped by God tonight. Four things. First and foremost tonight, when we're equipped by God, it doesn't reflect us. It reflects God. It reflects God and not you. Secondly, being equipped by God, it always comes at the right time. Even though the timing may not seem like it's our time, it's in God's time. So, uh, thirdly tonight, being equipped by God builds our faith and reliance on him. And finally, being equipped by God starts by opening our mouths. Did you guys get something out of the word of the Lord tonight? <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. Hey, listen, I want to do one more thing. I want to I speak to you for a moment. I want to ask everybody, just give me a moment more of your attention. Please don't get up. Don't walk around. Let me just, let me ask you a question. It's really important that, that you examine this, and you examine your heart and your life in this moment. You know, it would be a tragedy for us to get together, to have church, to worship God, to, to hear about a message about being equipped or empowered by God, about batteries being included in our lives, and not give you the opportunity to examine your eternal life with God. So let me ask you this question. I want you to answer within your heart. If you were to leave this place today, and heaven forbid this be the case, but if you were to leave this place today and your heart were to stop beating and you were to die, would you find yourself in heaven or would you find yourself in hell? It's a relatively simple question, you know, but nobody's going to know that answer except you and God. So why don't we go over maybe some of those answers that you might have had in your heart? You know, you might say, Pastor Luke, I think I'm going to get to heaven. I hope I'm going to get to heaven. Pastor Luke, I sure want to get to heaven. Did you know that nowhere in the word of God will you find that you can think you can hope or you can want to get to heaven that God's going to look on you and say, well, they desired it so much or they wanted it bad enough, I'm going to let them in. It's not about how much you think. It's not about how much you hope or how much you want. You can't get to heaven that way. Hey, you know, you might even say, well, Pastor Luke, you know, to be honest with you, I'm not sure about hell. I'm not sure about heaven. I, you know, I've heard from people on this side and on that side, and I don't know where I stand on the matter. I don't, I'm not sure if hell even exists or if it's eternal or anything of that nature. Hey, listen, it doesn't matter what you think or what you've heard. It doesn't matter what somebody said in the past or, the, or, 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 or in, the, in, in the present. It doesn't matter about any of that thing. The fact of the matter is that heaven is a real place. Hell is a very real place. And regardless of what you feel about it, they exist. And that's like saying, you know, I don't believe in a semi-truck. Maybe because somebody told you as a kid you didn't, that they didn't exist. And you say, I don't believe that semi-trucks exist. And you might believe that all your life. But you go and stand on the slow lane of the freeway. And lo and behold, I guarantee you'll meet one face to face. So, listen, I love you enough, I respect you enough, I honor you enough to not play games with you, to tell you the truth like it is. doesn't matter what you believe of heaven or hell, it's real, and we need to start treating it like it is. Well, but Pastor Luke, you know, my parents took me to church as a child. Uh, you know, I was christened as a baby. I went to church on Christmas and on Easter. They told me all my life that I was a Christian. I went to Sunday school or Sabbath school or catechism classes. So doesn't that mean that I'm going to get into heaven? Hey, did you know that nowhere in the Word of God will you find that because your parents took you to church as a child, because you were baptized or christened as a baby, that you're going to get into heaven? Did you know that nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because you attend church on Christmas and on Easter that you're going to get yourself into heaven? 
Hey, did you know that nowhere can you find in the Word of God that because you attended Sunday school, Sabbath school, or catechism classes that you're going to get your way into heaven? You're just not going to find that in the Word of God. Well, but, but Pastor Luke, Pastor Luke, I'm a good person. You know, I've never robbed uh, the 7-Eleven. I don't cheat on my taxes. I give to charitable organizations. I wear Tom's shoes, whatever it might be. Pastor Luke, I'm a good person, and good people go to heaven. Hey, listen. I don't know where you heard that from. I don't know where we came up with that idea, but nowhere in the Word of God will you find that good people go to heaven. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that our our good deeds, according to God, are like filthy rags. You see, nothing we could ever do on our own would ever make us good enough to get into heaven. It's just not that way. There's more to it than that. We talked about that today. God reflects, God's uh, uh, provision in our life reflects him, not us. You see, it's not about us. It's about him. The only way you and I can get to heaven is is God's way. You see, God's the creator of the universe. He stretched all things. He put all things into motion. So the only way that God would would let us get into heaven is his heaven, is his way. So the only way you and I can get there is God's way. And let me tell you something. It's not because you're a good person. It's not because you think you're a Christian. It's not because you've given yourself the title of being a Christian. You'll not find that in the word of God. The only way you and I can get to heaven is God's way. A man by the name of Nicodemus comes to Jesus. And he asks Jesus, what must I do to get into heaven? What must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, the Bible tells us that Nicodemus was a Pharisee, a leader of the Jews. What that means to us is that in our day and age, Nicodemus was the equivalent of something like a Ph.D. Nicodemus dedicated his young life to studying and to memorizing the word of God. Nicodemus taught in the temple, in the synagogues. Nicodemus wore all the right clothes. He gave to the poor. He did all the right things. And you would think that when Nicodemus comes to Jesus Christ and says, what must I do to get into heaven? Jesus would say, well, Nicodemus, you just keep on going. Great is your reward in heaven. You would think that because you and I maybe have memorized John 3, 16 and a few other verses because we've sat in services, because we've carried the pastor's Bible or we've volunteered in the children's of the youth ministry, that Jesus would look at us and say, wow, you just keep on going. But the fact of the matter is it's nothing about the outside. It's about the heart. And Jesus looks to Nicodemus, the leader of the Jews, the Pharisee, and he says to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Now, born again, what does that mean? You've heard that term. You think Hollywood popular culture, society, they made a mockery out of that. You think of radical, out-of-control, weirdo, cultish Christianity. But hey, listen, I don't care what Hollywood's made of that term from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. According to God's heart, it's always meant the same thing. And here's what it is, that it it means that you've given God all of your heart and you've given God all of your life. You see, it's an all-or-nothing relationship with God. He wants all of your heart. He wants all of your life. Let me prove it to you again in the Word of God. In the book of Revelation, the last book of your Bible, Jesus Christ is speaking to the believers. He's speaking to a church, people like you and I sitting and hearing the word of God doing good things in our lives. And he says to them, I know your deeds, but when I come back, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. It's a gruesome, grotesque, shocking statement designed to get your attention. And what Jesus Christ is saying is that lukewarm Christians are not going to make it into heaven. So what does that mean? What does lukewarm mean in terms of your relationship with God? Lukewarm means this. It means in your relationship with God, you're a little bit in, you're a little bit out, you're a little bit up and down. Occasional church attendance floating around, doing your own thing, doing some of God's thing. You got a cross or St. Christopher around your neck. Maybe you even went and got a Jesus tattoo at one point in your life, but you're doing your own thing instead of God's thing. You're riding the fence right down the middle. And Jesus Christ says to you, If that's you, if you're living lukewarm, he says, listen, you are deceived in thinking that you're going to get your way into heaven. It's not about actions. It's about the heart, all of your heart. It's about all of your life. So in a moment, speaking about doing it God's way, it's God's heaven, it's God's way. You know, we can't get to heaven your way. Hey, we can't get to heaven my way. We can't get to heaven some well-meaning church committee or author's way. The only way you and I can get to heaven with God is God's way. How do we do that? Jesus Christ says this. He says that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man goes to the Father except through him. So it's not about you, it's not about me, it's not about some magical thing, but rather, the only way you and I can get to heaven is through Jesus Christ. In a moment, I'm going to give you the opportunity. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, I'm going to hit my Bible on the count of three. I'm going to go three, just like that. And that's your opportunity. In just a moment, when I count to three, I want to give you the opportunity to raise your hand. And And what you're doing by raising your hand is you're saying, you know what? Jesus, I want to give you all of my heart. God, I want to give you all of my life today. I acknowledge that I want to give you all of my heart. I acknowledge I want to give you all of my life. 
You say, Pastor Luke, if I raise my hand, I'm going to be embarrassed. You see, somebody that I came with, they might have thought that I was this or that. So they, uh, they're going to know the truth about me. Listen, the fact of the matter is, is that I'm not going to embarrass you. But maybe because you raise your hand, you might be embarrassed. But you know what? Let me tell you something. Let me love you enough. Let me respect you enough. Let me honor you enough to, to tell you the truth. Get over it today. Isn't it better to spend a moment of embarrassment and go forward in your relationship with God than to spend an eternity, an eternity forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever in hell because you couldn't go forward for God today? So, hey, listen, you might be embarrassed because you put your hand up, but let's move on from that. Today is the day of your salvation. Jesus Christ said this. He said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. If you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. You see, the decision is yours. God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He's not going to force his way in. You can't raise the hand of the person next to you. It's between you and God. God's already done everything he could to open up the doors of heaven to you by giving you his son, Jesus Christ, to die a beaten, bloody mess, to hang a spectacle on a cross for all the world to see so that you and I today could give him all of our hearts and give him all of our lives. So don't miss out on this opportunity. Who should raise their hand in a moment? If you've never given him all of your heart, if you've never given him all your life in a moment, when I count to three, you need to get your hand up. Who should raise their hand? If you've never made a public profession of, the, of your faith, maybe you raised your hand at a Billy Graham or a Harvest Crusade, but you never follow through with it. That's okay. Today, get your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. Put it right back down. And let's go forward for God and your relationship with God today. Who should raise their hand finally? If you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing, hey, hey, if you've been riding the fence today, for just a moment, get your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. We'll go forward from there. And let's make today you go hot in your relationship for Jesus Christ and ensure your place for eternity, forever, in the presence of God. The decision's yours. God's already done everything he can. Now you've got to choose. So in a moment here, I'm going to do I'm going to count to three. Don't miss this opportunity. Today is the day of your salvation. Don't walk out of this place without making sure tonight. Here we go. On the count of three, I'm going to count. Hands are getting ready to go up. If that's you, get ready. One, two, three. Let me see your hands in the house tonight. Where are you at in the house tonight? One, two, three. I see you. Three wise people. Four. I see you, my friend. Five. Okay, I see you back there. I see that hand. Five wise people. Anybody else in the house tonight? Six, seven. I see you back there in the family rooms. Is there anybody over there in the family room? Seven wise people. Hey, I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. You say, man, I wonder if I should do this. I wonder if I should do this today. If that's in this place, get your hand up so I can see it. And I'll, you, I'll acknowledge you and put it right back down. Hey, come on. Let's move forward for God today. Anybody else in the house today? All right, I see you back there in the family room. Eight. Eight wise people. Where are you at, number nine? Where are you at, number ten? If there's eight people, you know there's ten. You're saying, saying, man, I wonder if I should. Let me just get out of here. I don't know. I'm uncomfortable about this. Hey, come on. Let's go forward for God today. It's your choice. It's your decision. Anybody else in the house today? Eight wise people. Where are you at, number nine? Where are you at, number ten? Thinking, man, I wonder if I should. Come on. Come on. I know you're in this place today. I can't make you. Where are you at? Eight wise people. Anybody else in the house today? Anybody else today want to give their heart, want to give their life to Jesus Christ? Well, praise God for the eight wise people. Hallelujah. Here's what I want to do. You said you were going to give Jesus Christ all your heart, all your life. We want to help you. We're going to pray with you. In a moment, I'm going to ask everybody to stand together. And when I do, I want you to be bold. If you raise your hand, hey, listen, if you should have raised your hand, I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your Bible, a friend if you need a friend, somebody that you came with, and grab them. Be bold. Get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. Get into the aisles and come meet me at the altar. You said you were going to give Jesus Christ all of your heart, all of your life. Let us help you. Let us pray with you today from the family rooms, from the front to the back. If you're, it doesn't matter how old you are or how young you are. Get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. Let's all stand together. And if that's you, if you, gave, if you raised your hand today, come on, get out of your seat. Get out of your chair and come meet me up here at the altar. You can come. Come on. Come on. You can come. You can come. Come on. If that's you, if you raise your hand, come on down. Come on. If that's you, come on. It's not too late. If you raise your hand. You're serious about this. 
Get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. Come meet me up here today. Come on. We'll wait. Well, praise God. Praise God. Hey, listen. Not all eight came, but that's all right. You guys came. Today is the first day of the rest of your lives. Hey, listen. You're not going to a funeral. You're going to a birth celebration. Yours. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. I want to do something. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. This is right over here. This is Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave is like the nicest guy you're going to meet. I'm telling you, it's sickening how nice Pastor Dave is. It really is. I wish I could be as nice as Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave is going to take you right over there. Nothing weird goes on. Okay, hey, listen. The weirdest was that went on this morning was Pastor Dan. Okay, we already got past that. Nothing weird goes on. I'm just kidding, Pastor Dan. Nothing weird goes on. He's going to take you right over there. He's going to lead you in a prayer. Okay, you don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by asking Jesus Christ to come into your heart, come into your life. He's going to introduce you to us to some friends that we have at the church. Somebody to come alongside you. We call them spiritual personal trainers. They're going to come alongside you and invite you into a program that we have to help build you up. You know, you go to the gym, you get a personal trainer to help you build those weights to make sure that you're working the right way so that you're not wasting effort. Well, we want to have somebody come alongside you, buy you a cup of coffee before service, okay? Meet with you for a couple of weeks and just teach you some things in the Word of God to get you strong so that you don't go back to the things that you came from. And finally, he's going to give you some free things, some literature. You say, hey, guess what? I got saved. Now what do I do? We want to help you with that. We want to get you strong in the ways of the Lord and point you in the right direction in your new life with Jesus Christ. So if you guys would just go right over there with Pastor Dave.